Hello, my name is Charlie McCann. I'm the sound curator at the National Library of Scotland. In my role, I have responsibility for the library's collections of audio material, which includes everything from oral histories and birdsong to some of the earliest recordings of Scottish music on wax cylinder. As part of their community story project, Taylor and Audrey have asked us to deliver a couple of short presentations, briefly covering some of the skills you may require in order to record and keep safe your interviews. I'll be giving a short and hopefully sweet overview of digital preservation. I'll be covering three broad areas, organisation, storage and metadata, and discussing how they influence and enable preservation. But in true librarian style, I'll start with a warning. Sound is fragile. Recorded media, whether it be analogue or digital, is very susceptible to damage and loss. All the technologies we use to hold our sound material have their own strengths and weaknesses, which bring challenges and solutions. For example, analog disc carriers are stable but often fragile. They have limited storage capacity and can be expensive to store in bulk. Tapes and other magnetic media are prone to decay over time, especially if they're not stored correctly. And everyone's aware of the hubris that surrounded the indestructibility of CDs compared to the reality the effect of a tiny scratch has on one. Digital media, for all its storage and portability benefits, is perhaps the easiest of all to lose. We now produce so much material that it can become difficult to differentiate between one recording and the next. And despite its apparently ethereal nature, digital media is still subject to forms of rot and degradation. Audio recordings also require playback equipment, which brings with it risks around obsolescence, maintenance and any number of proprietorial considerations. In the digital era, these challenges have never been greater. It's worth keeping in mind that ultimately, digital media is held in physical locations on equipment with moving parts that are subject to wear and tear and often require third-party products for access. This also applies on the internet. Material is held on multiple computers managed by large corporations. Online presence does not equal indelibility, both because even the largest corporations aren't going to last forever, and for the most part, their goal is not to preserve in perpetuity. So, responsibility for preserving what we create lies with us for now. It requires thought and effort and should be factored into your projects from the very beginning. Getting organised. Thoughtful creation, selection, retention and organisation of your data and metadata will help you know what you've made and help you find it again later. It's helpful to think as if you're building something for someone else to use. Someone who doesn't have access to the inner organisational workings of your mind. As if you're explaining things to the people who come after you. Primarily, this means using a naming system that identifies one file from another and a logical arrangement for storing them on your computer. This will keep you organised and improve accessibility, helping you and others find what you're working on without getting lost amongst the haystack of indecipherable file names. Have a think about how you work and at what points you create data. For example, your recordings themselves, information about the interviewee, date and time of interview or interviews if you do more than one with the same subject, and whatever iterations or edits you carry out in the production process. Then build a folder that allows you to organise, manage and retrieve these reliably. A good file structure could well be applicable to multiple projects, so it's worth storing a template version you can return to and rename. Next, we require a consistent formula for naming your files. It needn't be complex, a simple date, keyword, file type structure will work. When deciding what form to use, it's worth considering something that will be understandable for future access and not just the requirements of the production process. Consistency and clarity are very important here. While it may seem time consuming and possibly to the detriment of your production in the initial stages, the benefits of planning and employing good archival practice at this stage are huge and will save untold frustration, if not loss of your work further down the line. Storage, where and how to store your files. 
Unlike with physical archive material, it is wise with digital stories to use multiple locations. This can be a slightly more complex consideration in comparison to box-on-shelf storage plans, but it's essential while planning for digital preservation. While it is tempting to store everything on your own computer for simplicity's sake, this soon becomes very difficult to scale and carries a lot of risk of something going wrong. Likewise, uploading and forgetting, and putting your faith in the old internet maxim of whatever is on the internet stays there. While this is a good rule of thumb when applied to photos you wouldn't want your boss seeing, it shouldn't be applied to your oral history interviews. It's worth keeping in mind that internet platforms are not actually in the business of archiving and have been known to be capricious about what they will allow to be published. They can also be costly and impose storage limitations. Instead, I'd advise you following the LOCKS model, and if the mnemonic, which stands for lots of copies, keeps stuff safe. Digital files are quick to copy, but also to delete, and while this makes them vulnerable in one sense, it also means it's a relatively simple process to make copies and spread them around. So should something go awry with one copy or location, you have backups. A 3-2-1 storage plan is a good idea. This means keeping three copies, two on different storage mechanisms, and one as far away from you as possible. Copy to two devices that use two different types of storage if possible. For example, a combination of hard drives, RAID devices and the cloud. All these options have their own strengths and weaknesses. Hard drives are affordable and portable and relatively easy to use, running automatic backups and cloning, for example. However, they are vulnerable to physical damage and will require migration every five years or so. RAIDs are like hard drives, but more so. Bigger, more professional, they back up on multiple disks. They're also more stable but they can be expensive and require some technical know-how to set up and operate. Finally, cloud storage. This is where the data is held securely by being distributed in multiple locations on many computers and data centres across the globe. The downside is, once again, third-party involvement. So be prepared to potentially lose some control over your material and perhaps commit to the cost of a long-term subscription. It's also best practice to create lossless, uncompressed versions of your file as a preservation copy. MP3s are serviceable for access and listening copies, but uncompressed formats like WAV, while being larger, retain a great deal more information about your recording. The more data you have, the less likely the file is susceptible to become corrupt. Digital preservation is in some respects about mitigating risk by choosing to store the highest quality material you can over a number of mechanisms and locations. The chances of simultaneous losses are greatly reduced. However, this does involve ongoing commitments to migration, maintenance and possibly cost in comparison to shelving analogue carriers. Metadata Creating and managing high quality metadata is an important part of digital preservation. Metadata describes what is in the file while also creating routes of access. Access is integral to preservation. After all, there is no point in archiving material that no one can retrieve. Think about metadata as rather like the writing on the box or casing of a cassette or reel. While some of this data is created automatically during the creation of the file, for example the file format and a lot of the technical information, other descriptive data, such as contributor names, locations and subjects, has to be added manually. Still more data may be created automatically, depending on the settings and capabilities of your equipment. MP3 and WAV files have a built-in area for adding metadata, the ID3 tags, which can be edited directly or using tag editor software or in a digital audio workstation such as Audacity. IASA, the International Association of Sound Archives, recommends using bwf.wav files, the broadcast standard, as the format contains headers which can be used for managing metadata. Self-description and the creation of transcripts are also extremely valuable with somewhat time-consuming forms of metadata creation. Publishing online. It's likely that you're working with the intention of putting your material online. The democratisation of audio production has created a huge and hugely welcome diversity in voices and topics, but it's brought new challenges too, especially around visibility and access. 
it's worth pointing out that when you publish your work to the web, you should keep in mind that no matter how rich your metadata and how visible your work actually is, you shouldn't assume permanence. Content producers will need to develop archival skills should they wish their work to have longevity. And for cultural memory institutions like the NLS, new and perhaps more pragmatic approaches to curation and collection may be needed. Not least around how best to communicate the value of archival standards online. To conclude, the most effective way of establishing resilience is to introduce archival practices into your workflows early and then do it consistently. You should store a lossless preservation copy both locally and off-site to protect against the impact of any damage to your equipment. Describe your work in as much detail as is practical, using a combination of manual and automatic means. Be ready to learn new skills and to think of digital preservation as a dynamic and ongoing process. Institutional collection of many forms of digital culture is at a relatively early stage, so developing preservation skills among a selection of producers and creators as diverse as their output is really important at the moment. If you'd like further advice, I'd strongly recommend checking out the Preserve This Podcast project. And if you'd like to get into some digital preservation more in depth, or matters specifically relating to archive and sound, go to the Digital Preservation Coalition or IASA websites for an embarrassment of riches when it comes to knowledge and resources. Thanks very much for listening, and thanks to the SCA for asking us to contribute.